Chapter Nine of Two Poets by Honoré de Balzac, translated by Ellen Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Nine. When everyone had arrived, when the buzz of talk ceased after repeated efforts on the part of Monsieur de Bargeton, who, obedient to his wife, went round the room much as the beadle makes the circle of the church, tapping the pavement with his wand when silence in fact was at last secured lucien went to the round table near madame de bargeton a fierce thrill of excitement ran through him as he did so he announced in an uncertain voice that to prevent disappointment he was about to read the masterpieces of a great poet discovered only recently for although andre de chenier's poems appeared in eighteen nineteen no one in angouleme had so much as heard of him everybody interpreted this announcement in one way it was a shift of madame de bargeton's meant to save the poet's self-love and to put the audience at ease lucien began with le malade and the poem was received with a murmur of applause but he followed it with la vogle which proved too great a strain upon the average intellect none but artists or those endowed with the artistic temperament can understand and sympathize with him in the diabolical torture of that reading if poetry is to be rendered by the voice and if the listener is to grasp all that it means the most devout attention is essential there should be an intimate alliance between the reader and his audience or swift and subtle communication of the poet's thought and feeling becomes impossible here this close sympathy was lacking and lucien in consequence was in the position of an angel who should endeavor to sing of heaven amid the chucklings of hell an intelligent man in the sphere most stimulating to his faculties can see in every direction like a snail he has the keen scent of a dog the ears of a mole he can hear and feel and see all that is going on around him a musician or a poet knows at once whether his audience is listening in admiration or fails to follow him and feels it as the plant that revives or droops under favorable or unfavorable conditions the men who had come with their wives had fallen to discussing their own affairs by the acoustic law before mentioned every murmur rang in lucien's ear he saw all the gaps caused by the spasmodic workings of jaws sympathetically affected the teeth that seemed to grin defiance at him when like the dove in the deluge he looked round for any spot on which his eyes might rest he saw nothing but rows of impatient faces their owners clearly were waiting for him to make an end they had come together to discuss questions of practical interest with the exceptions of lord de rastignac the bishop and two or three of the young men they one and all looked bored as a matter of fact those who understand poetry strive to develop the germs of another poetry quickened within them by the poet's poetry but this glacial audience so far from attaining to the spirit of the poet did not even listen to the letter lucien felt profoundly discouraged he was damp with chilly perspiration a glowing glance from louise to whom he turned gave him courage to persevere to the end but this poet's heart was bleeding from countless wounds do you find this very amusing fifine inquired the wizened lily who perhaps had expected some kind of gymnastics don't ask me what i think dear i cannot keep my eyes open when any one begins to read aloud i hope the nais will not give us poetry often in the evenings said francis if i am obliged to attend while somebody reads aloud after dinner it upsets my digestion poor dearie whispered zephirine take a glass of eau sucre it was very well declaimed said alexandre but i like whist better myself after this dictum which passed muster as a joke from the play on the word whist several card players were of the opinion that the reader's voice needed a rest and on this pretext one or two couples slipped away into the card-room 
but louise and the bishop and pretty lord de rastignac besought lucien to continue and this time he caught the attention of his audience with chenier's spirited reactionary iambe several persons carried away by his impassioned delivery applauded the reading without understanding the sense people of this sort are impressed by vociferation as a coarse palate is tickled by strong spirits during the interval as they partook of ices zephyrine dispatched francis to examine the volume and informed her neighbor amelie that the poetry was in print amelie brightened visibly why that is easily explained said she monsieur de rubempre works for a printer it is as if a pretty woman should make her own dresses she added looking at lolotte he printed his poetry himself said the women among themselves then why does he call himself monsieur de rubempre inquired jacques if a noble takes a handicraft he ought to lay his name aside so he did as a matter of fact said zizine but his name was plebeian and he took his mother's name which is noble well if his verses are printed we can read them for ourselves said astolphe this piece of stupidity complicated the question until sixte du chatelet condescended to inform these unlettered folk that the prefatory announcement was no oratorical flourish but a statement of fact and added that the poems had been written by a royalist brother of marie joseph chenier the revolutionary leader all angouleme except madame de rastignac and her two daughters and the bishop who had really felt the grandeur of the poetry were mystified and took offence at the hoax there was a smothered murmur but lucien did not heed it the intoxication of the poetry was upon him he was far away from the hateful world striving to render in speech the music that filled his soul seeing the faces about him through a cloudy haze he read the sombre elegy on the suicide lines in the taste of a bygone day pervaded by sublime melancholy then he turned to the page where the line occurs thy songs are sweet i love to say them over and ended with the delicate idol Neyer. madame de bargeton sat with one hand buried in her curls heedless of the havoc she wrought among them gazing before her with unseeing eyes alone in her drawing-room lost in delicious dreaming for the first time in her life she had been transported to the sphere which was hers by right of nature judge therefore how unpleasantly she was disturbed by amelie who took it upon herself to express the general wish nais this voice broke in we came to hear monsieur chardon's poetry and you are giving us poetry out of a book the extracts are very nice but the ladies feel a patriotic preference for the wine of the country they would rather have it the french language does not lend itself very readily to poetry does it astolphe remarked to chatelet cicero's prose is a thousand times more poetical to my way of thinking the true poetry of france is song lyric verse chatelet answered which proves that our language is eminently adapted for music said adrien i should very much like to hear the poetry that has cost nais her reputation said zephyrine but after receiving amelie's request in such a way it is not very likely that she will give us a specimen she ought to have them recited in justice to herself said francis the little fellow's genius is his sole justification you have been in the diplomatic service said amelie to monsieur du chatelet go and manage it somehow nothing easier said the baron the princess's private secretary being accustomed to petty manoeuvres of this kind went to the bishop and contrived to bring him to the fore at the bishop's entreaty nais had no choice but to ask lucien to recite his own verses for them and the baron received a languishing smile from amelie as the reward of his prompt success decidedly the baron is a very clever man she observed to lolotte 
but emilie's previous acidulous remark about women who made their own dresses rankled in lolotte's mind since when have you begun to recognize the emperor's barons she asked smiling lucien had essayed to deify his beloved in an ode dedicated to her under a title in favor with all lads who write verse after leaving school this ode so fondly cherished so beautiful since it was the outpouring of all the love in his heart seemed to him to be the one piece of his own work that could hold its own with chenier's verse and with a tolerably fatuous glance at madame de bargeton he announced to her he struck an attitude proudly for the delivery of the ambitious piece for his author's self-love felt safe and at ease behind madame de bargeton's petticoat and at the self-same moment madame de bargeton betrayed her own secret to the women's curious eyes although she had always looked down upon this audience from her own loftier intellectual heights she could not help trembling for lucien her face was troubled there was a sort of mute appeal for indulgence in her glances and while the verses were recited she was obliged to lower her eyes and dissemble her pleasure as stanza followed stanza to her out of the glowing heart of the torrent of glory and light at the foot of jehovah's throne where the angels stand afar each on a sastron of gold repeating the prayers of the night put up for each by his star out from the cherubim choir a bright-haired angel springs veiling the glory of god that dwells on a dazzling brow leaving the courts of heaven to sink upon silver wings down to our world below god looked in pity on earth and the angel reading his thought came down to lull the pain of the mighty spirit at strife reverent bent o'er the maid and for age left desolate brought flowers of the springtime of life bringing a dream of hope to solace the mother's fears hearkening unto the voice of the tardy repentant cry glad as angels are glad to reckon earth's pitying tears given with alms of a sigh one there is and but one bright messenger sent from the skies whom earth like a lover fain would hold from the heavenward flight but the angel weeping turns and gazes with sad sweet eyes up to the heaven of light not by the radiant eyes not by the kindling glow of virtue sent from god did i know the secret sign nor read the token sent on a white and dazzling brow of an origin divine nay it was love grown blind and dazed with excess of light striving and striving in vain to mingle earth and heaven helpless and powerless against the invincible armor bright by the dread archangel given ah be wary take heed lest aught should be seen or heard of the shining seraph band as they take the heavenward way too soon the angel on earth will learn the magical word sung at the close of the day then you shall see afar rifting the darkness of night a gleam as of dawn that spread across the starry floor and the seamen that watch for a sign shall mark the track of their flight a luminous pathway in heaven and a beacon for evermore do you read the riddle said amelie giving monsieur du chatelet a coquettish glance it is the sort of stuff that we all of us wrote more or less after we left school said the baron with a bored expression he was acting his part of arbiter of taste who has seen everything we used to deal in oceanic mists malvinas and fingals and cloudy shapes and warriors who got out of their tombs with stars above their heads nowadays this poetical frippery has been replaced by jehovah angels sastrons the plumes of seraphim and all the paraphernalia of paradise freshened up with a few new words such as immense infinite solitude intelligence 
you have lakes and the words of the almighty a kind of christianized pantheism enriched with the most extraordinary and unheard-of rhymes we are in quite another latitude in fact we have left the north for the east but the darkness is just as thick as before if the ode is obscure the declaration is very clear it seems to me said zephyrine and the archangel's armor is a tolerably thin gauze robe said francis politeness demanded that the audience should profess to be enchanted with the poem and the women furious because they had no poets in their train to extol them as angels rose looked bored by the reading murmuring very nice charming perfect with frigid coldness if you love me do not congratulate the poet or his angel lolotte laid her commands on her dear adrien in imperious tones and adrien was fain to obey empty words after all zephyrine remarked to francis and love is a poem that we live you have just expressed the very thing that i was thinking zizine but i should not have put it so neatly said stanislas scanning himself from top to toe with loving attention i would give i don't know how much to see nais's pride brought down a bit said amelie addressing chatelet nais sets up to be an archangel as if she were better than the rest of us and mixes us up with low people his father was an apothecary and his mother is a nurse his sister works in a laundry and he himself is a printer's foreman if his father sold biscuits for worms ver said jacques he ought to have made his son take them he is continuing in his father's line of business for the stuff that he has just been reading to us is a drug in the market it seems said stanislas striking one of his most killing attitudes drug for drug i would rather have something else every one apparently combined to humiliate lucien by various aristocrats sarcasms lili the religious thought it a charitable deed to use any means of enlightening nais and nais was on the brink of a piece of folly francis the diplomatist undertook the direction of the silly conspiracy every one was interested in the progress of the drama it would be something to talk about to-morrow the ex-consul being far from anxious to engage in a duel with a young poet who would fly into a rage at the first hint of insult under his lady's eyes was wise enough to see that the only way of dealing lucien his death-blow was by the spiritual arm which was safe from vengeance he therefore followed the example set by chatelet the astute and went to the bishop him he proceeded to mystify he told the bishop that lucien's mother was a woman of uncommon powers and great modesty and that it was she who found the subjects for her son's verses nothing pleased lucien so much according to the guileful francis as any recognition of her talents he worshipped his mother then having inculcated these notions he left the rest to time his lordship was sure to bring out the insulting allusion for which he had been so carefully prepared in the course of conversation when francis and the bishop joined the little group where lucien stood the circle who gave him the cup of hemlock to drain by little sips watched him with redoubled interest the poet luckless young man being a total stranger and unaware of the manners and customs of the house could only look at madame de bargeton and give embarrassed answers to embarrassing questions he knew neither the names nor condition of the people about him the women's silly speeches made him blush for them and he was at his wit's end for a reply he felt moreover how very far removed he was from these divinities of angouleme when he heard himself addressed sometimes as monsieur chardon sometimes as monsieur de rubempre while they addressed each other as lolotte adrien astolphe lili and fifine 
his confusion rose to a height when taking lili for a man's surname he addressed the coarse monsieur de senonches as monsieur lili that nimrod broke in upon him with a monsieur lulu and madame de bargeton flushed red to the eyes a woman must be blind indeed to bring this little fellow among us muttered senonches zephyrine turned to speak to the marquise de pimentel do you not see a strong likeness between monsieur chardon and monsieur de quintecroix madame she asked in a low but quite audible voice the likeness is ideal smiled madame de pimentel glory has a power of attraction to which we can confess said madame de bargeton addressing the marquise some women are as much attracted by greatness as others by littleness she added looking at francis this was beyond zephyrine's comprehension she thought her consul a very great man but the marquise laughed and her laughter ranged her on nais's side you are very fortunate monsieur said the marquis de pimentel addressing lucien for the purpose of calling him monsieur de rubempre and not monsieur chardon as before you should never find time heavy on your hands do you work quickly asked lolotte much in the way that she would have asked a joiner if it took long to make a box the bludgeon stroke stunned lucien but he raised his head at madame de bargeton's reply my dear poetry does not grow in monsieur de rubempre's head like grass in our courtyards madame we cannot feel too reverently towards the noble spirits in whom god has set some ray of this light said the bishop addressing lolotte yes poetry is something holy poetry implies suffering how many silent nights those verses that you admire have cost we should bow in love and reverence before the poet his life here is almost always a life of sorrow but god doubtless reserves a place in heaven for him among his prophets this young man is a poet he added laying a hand on lucien's head do you not see the sign of fate set on that high forehead of his glad to be so generously championed lucien made his acknowledgments in a grateful look not knowing that the worthy prelate was to deal his death-blow madame de bargeton's eyes travelled round the hostile circle her glances went like arrows to the depths of her rivals hearts and left them twice as furious as before ah monseigneur cried lucien hoping to break thick heads with his golden sceptre but ordinary people have neither your intellect nor your charity no one heeds our sorrows our toil is unrecognized the gold digger working in the mine does not labor as we to wrest metaphors from the heart of the most ungrateful of all languages if this is poetry to give ideas such definite and clear expressions that all the world can see and understand the poet must continually range through the entire scale of human intellects so that he can satisfy the demands of all he must conceal hard thinking and emotion to antagonistic powers beneath the most vivid color he must know how to make one word cover a whole world of thought he must give the results of whole systems of philosophy in a few picturesque lines indeed his songs are like seeds that must break into blossom in other hearts wherever they find the soil prepared by personal experience how can you express unless you first have felt and is not passion suffering poetry is only brought forth after painful wanderings in the vast regions of thought and life there are men and women in books who seem more really alive to us than men and women who have lived and died richardson's clarissa chenier's camille the delia of tibullus ariosto's angelica dante's francesca moliere's alceste beaumarchais's figaro scott's rebecca the jewess the don quixote of cervantes 
do we not owe these deathless creations to immortal throes and what are you going to create for us asked chatelet if i were to announce such conceptions i should give myself out for a man of genius should i not answered lucien and besides such sublime creations demand a long experience of the world and a study of human passion and interests which i could not possibly have made but i have made a beginning he added with bitterness in his tone as he took a vengeful glance round the circle the time of gestation is long then it will be a case of difficult labor interrupted m de hauteuil your excellent mother might assist you suggested the bishop the epigram innocently made by the good prelate the long-looked-for revenge kindled a gleam of delight in all eyes the smile of satisfied caste that travelled from mouth to mouth was aggravated by m de bargeton's imbecility he burst into a laugh as usual some moments later monseigneur you are talking a little above our heads these ladies do not understand your meaning said madame de bargeton and the words paralyzed the laughter and drew astonished eyes upon her a poet who looks to the bible for his inspiration has a mother indeed in the church monsieur de rubempre will you recite st john and patmos for us or belshazzar's feast so that his lordship may see that rome is still the magna parens of virgil the women exchanged smiles at the latin words the bravest and highest spirits know times of prostration at the outset of life lucien had sunk to the depths at the blow but he struck the bottom with his feet and rose to the surface again vowing to subjugate this little world he rose like a bull stung to fury by a shower of darts and prepared to obey louise by declaiming saint john in patmos but by this time the card tables had claimed their complement of players who returned to the accustomed groove to find amusement there which poetry had not afforded them they felt besides that the revenge of so many outraged vanities would be incomplete unless it were followed up by contemptuous indifference so they showed their tacit disdain for the native product by leaving lucien and madame de bargeton to themselves every one appeared to be absorbed in his own affairs one chattered with the prefect about a new cross-road another proposed to vary the pleasures of the evening with a little music the great world of angouleme feeling that it was no judge of poetry was very anxious in the first place to hear the verdict of the Piemontels and the rastignacs and formed a little group about them the great influence wielded in the department by these two families was always felt on every important occasion every one was jealous of them every one paid court to them foreseeing that they might some day need that influence what do you think of our poet and his poetry jacques asked of the marquise jacques used to shoot over the lands belonging to the piemontel family why it is not bad for provincial poetry she said smiling and besides such a beautiful poet cannot do anything amiss every one thought the decision admirable it travelled from lip to lip gaining malignance by the way then chatelet was called upon to accompany m du bartas on the piano while he mangled the great solo from figaro and the way being opened to music the audience as in duty bound listened while chatelet in turn sang one of chateaubriand's ballads a chivalrous ditty made in the time of the empire duets followed of the kind usually left to boarding-school misses and rescued from the schoolroom by madame du brassard who meant to make a brilliant display of her dear camille's talents for m de Severac's benefit madame de bargeton hurt by the contempt which every one showed her poet paid back scorn for scorn by going to her boudoir during these performances she was followed by the prelate 
his vicar-general had just been explaining the profound irony of the epigram into which he had been entrapped and the bishop wished to make amends mademoiselle de rastignac fascinated by the poetry also slipped into the boudoir without her mother's knowledge louise drew lucien to her mattress cushioned sofa and with no one to see or hear she murmured in his ear dear angel they did not understand you but thy songs are sweet i love to say them over and lucien took comfort from the pretty speech and forgot his woes for a little glory is not to be had cheaply madame de bargeton continued taking his hand and holding it tightly in her own endure your woes my friend you will be great one day your pain is the price of your immortality if only i had a hard struggle before me god preserve you from the enervating life without battles in which the eagle's wings have no room to spread themselves i envy you for if you suffer at least you live you will put out your strength you will feel the hope of victory your strife will be glorious and when you shall come to your kingdom and reach the imperial sphere where great minds are enthroned then remember the poor creatures disinherited by fate whose intellects pine in an oppressive moral atmosphere who die and have never lived knowing all the while what life might be think of the piercing eyes that have seen nothing the delicate senses that have only known the scent of poison flowers then tell in your song of plants that wither in the depths of the forest choked by twining growths and rank greedy vegetation plants that have never been kissed by the sunlight and die never having put forth a blossom it would be a terribly gloomy poem would it not a fanciful subject what a sublime poem might be made of the story of some daughter of the desert transported to some cold western clime calling for her beloved son dying of a grief that none can understand overcome with cold and longing it would be an allegory many lives are like that you would picture the spirit which remembers heaven said the bishop some one surely must have written such a poem in the days of old i like to think that i see a fragment of it in the song of songs take that as your subject said lord de rastignac expressing her artless belief in lucien's powers the great sacred poem of france is still unwritten remarked the bishop believe me glory and success await the man of talent who shall work for religion that task will be his said madame de bargeton rhetorically do you not see the first beginnings of the vision of the poem like the flame of dawn in his eyes nais is treating us very badly said fifine what can she be doing don't you hear said stanislas she is flourishing away using big words that you cannot make head or tail of amelie fifine adrien and francis appeared in the doorway with madame de rastignac who came to look for her daughter nais cried the two ladies both delighted to break in upon the quiet chat in the boudoir it would be very nice of you to come and play something for us my dear child monsieur de rubempre is just about to recite his saint john in patmos a magnificent biblical poem biblical echoed fifine in amazement emilie and fifine went back to the drawing-room taking the word back with them as food for laughter lucien pleaded a defective memory and excused himself when he reappeared nobody took the slightest notice of him every one was chatting or busy at the card-tables the poet's aureole had been plucked away the landowners had no use for him the more pretentious sort looked upon him as an enemy to their ignorance while the women were jealous of madame de bargeton the beatrice of this modern dante to use the vicar-general's phrase and looked at him with cold scornful eyes so this is society lucien said to himself as he went down to l'houmeau by the steps of beaulieu 
for there are times when we choose to take the longest way that the physical exercise of walking may promote the flow of ideas so far from being disheartened the fury of repulsed ambition gave lucien new strength like all those whose instincts bring them to a higher social sphere which they reach before they can hold their own in it lucien vowed to make any sacrifice to the end that he might remain on that higher social level one by one he drew out the poisoned shafts on his way home talking aloud to himself scoffing at the fools with whom he had to do inventing neat answers to their idiotic questions desperately vexed that the witty responses occurred to him so late in the day by the time that he reached the bordeaux road between the river and the foot of the hill he thought that he could see eve and david sitting on a balk of timber by the river in the moonlight and went down the footpath towards them End of chapter nine